Friday to another interview on TalkingWithHeroes.com from Afghanistan. I am Bob Calvert, your host. The website is www.TalkingWithHeroes.com. Our online news site is www.ThankYouForYourService.us. As most of you probably already know, we've been here now for over 10 days. You've been watching the videos. And for those of you that have been watching them and sharing them with other people, we really appreciate the help. Mainly our troops appreciate the help in getting their, their stories out. Before we get started on our next interview, I always want to thank the people that made this trip possible. I'm Rob Brazell with ReturnToWork.org out of Boulder, Colorado, Blackhawk.com, uh, Anthony Pace of FreedomHunters.org in Colorado, Newsblaze.com, Bill Wisniewski with 5Jump.com, number 5Jump.com, did all the filming for the Airborne at uh, Fort Benning. Sportsman's Warehouse in Colorado Springs at sportsmanswarehouse.com. My good friend Eric Chia in Olathe, Kansas. And uh, Colin Clark in Elizabeth, Colorado. We're hearing a lot more about Colin uh, with his environmental pallet company. Debbie Gregory with militaryconnection.com. Soldiersangels.org. And of course, Chief Warrant Officer retired Dennis McCormack, who retired from Fort Carson. Uh, so now we're going to go to our next interview. Okay, it's a privilege to introduce a senior civilian representative with Task Force Mountain Warrior with the State Department. So I want to introduce Dante Paradiso. Welcome, sir, to Talking With Heroes. Thank you. That's John's name, right? You did. Oh, All okay, right, that's good. <laughs> okay, um, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? And I know we were talking about the area uh, from New York City and all that, but, and then uh, tell about yourself and then talk about working for the State Department. Okay, well, I'm, um, as you said, I'm from New York, and uh, I've uh, been with the State Department since 2002. Um, I was a uh, lawyer before, and you know, I joined in the post-9-11 crowd, um, wanted to go over and serve, um, and, uh, you know, I've uh, spent a lot of time in Africa, uh, and a lot of time uh, working with the military, actually, uh, in my career. Um, my first uh, tour, I was with... Uh, uh, JTF Liberia, which was a joint task force that deployed into our embassy. Um, and then uh, I, I also worked in Djibouti with our counterterrorism base there, and uh, worked a little bit in Ethiopia with uh, Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa, which is a base in Djibouti, but they have uh, soldiers that go around it. Uh, I worked a little bit on the AFRICOM transition. So I've had a lot of experience with working with uh, uh, the troops, and uh, I had this opportunity I was in Ethiopia, I saw that there was an opening to uh, come to Afghanistan and, and serve as an advisor uh, for a combat brigade. Um, and uh, one of the things is they expanded the role a little bit so that I have uh, management and oversight responsibility for the uh, other civilians who work for the ambassador um, uh, in the four provinces that the brigade covers. So we got. Uh, when I got here, there were about 10 of those uh, people, we call them chief of mission people, and um, they come from USAID, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and uh, the State Department. And now we're up to about 40, and we'll probably have about 50 by the time I leave. Um, and, you know, these are people all embedded with the troops, and we've got folks uh, at the brigade level, battalion level, and down to the company level. Um, so, um, in addition to management and oversight uh, of all those folks, you know, I work uh, as a counterpart with Colonel George on the civilian side, um, and uh, you know, we work a lot of strategy, uh, a lot of engagement with uh, Afghan leaders, um, and uh, sort of uh, working with all the you know, battalions and companies and uh, civilians to try to get um, you know some forward progress here. So that's basically the nature of my job. That's amazing. Yeah. Be interesting to talk to you more at some point about Africa. I yeah. imagine that would have yeah. been fascinating to be over there. Uh, okay, when I was in uh, Calagouche, yeah. I met a uh, USAID worker when I was in mm -hmm. defect. So that, that would be one of your team? Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay. That would be George Like. He's up there. Um, we've just added a second USAID person uh, up there. So, uh, you know, with the provincial reconstruction teams, they always have the civilians. What we've done a little differently here is we also have something called district support teams. Mm -hmm. Um, um, where we've had uh, civilians out with the battalions and companies. So that's a little different. The, the provincial reconstruction teams were um, designed as civil 
civilian military teams to kind of rebuild and do governance in Afghanistan. But um, what we found is is that uh, you know they they can reach a small part of of each province on a regular basis. But the battalions have company headquarters and they've got uh, OPs and you know they're they're out. Uh, even more than the PRTs, because you just have units on the ground interacting with the population, uh, which is you know, critical to counterinsurgency. And so again, um, our, you know, our civilians have been able to, to work with folks out at uh, out these uh, outposts as well. So. My first question would be then about the, the PRT teams, because I had calls coming in from some of them uh, before I came over. Yeah. Talk about what it was like as far as progress, the, the, the uh, reconstruction, the governance, when you got here, talk about some of the progress that you've seen. Well, I think, um, you know, we, uh, a lot has been done in the last eight years. Um, a lot of roads have been built, um, and, and that's really significant because what that's done is uh, it's really opened up commerce. Um, you know, wherever the, the hard top follows, um, you know, all of the benefits of globalization can flow in. So this country is, you know, borders on China, borders on Pakistan, that's where a lot of the goods come in, you know, particularly in this area, and because uh, um, we're on the Pakistan border here in these provinces. And so all the little shops and everything, you know, have sort of followed the roads. Uh, they also built a whole bunch of bridges, um, and, and that's had a significant impact because, for example, if you take the Kunar River, uh, a major river that runs up a along the Pakistan border, um, they, they built seven bridges, and, and before, the communities on either side of the river didn't really connect with each other. They had to go long, uh, you know, routes to find a, a shallow enough crossing to get across, and uh, that's really opened up trade and communication between di different communities. Um, and then a place like uh, Jalalabad, where we are now, um, is, uh, you know, kind of an economic hub because it's uh, in between Peshawar and Kabul. Peshawar is a, a big city in Pakistan where we have a consulate, um, and you go through the Khyber Pass, and, and there's a big agricultural zone, but this is also a transit point for all sorts of things, uh, goods and, and services that, that flow through the country. Um, so with uh, the security that sort of followed more or less since uh, 2001, there's been you know, significant progress that you can see. Uh, in the, in the sense, uh, you know, one indicator is that a lot of people are returning. A lot of people have been refugees uh, over time in Pakistan. They've fled long years of war, um, and uh, you know they've come back and, and they're you know buying property and uh, they're reinvesting and they're returning uh, to Afghanistan. So you know that's a pretty good sign of sort of progress there uh, on that side. But what we found is is that then the challenge comes in trying to really connect a lot of those people into their government um, because they're, they're learning about this new structure that hasn't been in place uh, before. Um, they're, they're learning about, uh, you know, how to participate. A lot of the more remote communities um, are sort of learning, you know, about what the Afghan government can provide, um, how it can allocate resources and things like that. And so, you know, our challenge has been uh, you know, here in the in the brigade, we, we really work across lines of effort and lines of operation. So we don't just say governance is this lane and development is that lane. It's it's all connected with security, um, and, and that's kind of how we approach the, the problem. Here. And of course, the security has to come first because you, that's that's how you're able to go in and do the projects and, and get the people to work with you. They feel a little more secure. Well, you know, that's a very interesting point. I think that. Uh, you know, governance uh, in Afghanistan really can't be separated from security. In other words, uh, a lot of these communities are, are people that have uh, felt outside of the government for a long time. And, and to engage security, you have to really kind of figure out, you know, uh, where the community stands. And the only way you can do that is really talking with people and being out with the people. And so. Um, to provide security, you also have to do engagement and governance. And so, if people are really frustrated with a local government official or a, a corrupt police chief, um, then that creates part of the security issue. You mentioned corruption. I've been hearing that corruption is a 
is a good part of the problem, but you're working on it. And I've heard there's progress being made. There is progress. I, you know, I think um, you know what we found is is that by engaging communities, they've uh, been able to take a stand and, and uh, helped work with us to identify people that are you know really not acting in the best interest of the country, um, and, and that's helped us raise that with national leaders and provincial leaders. Um, you know, to help make the, the necessary personnel changes or just, uh, you know, course corrective actions. And, and the other thing that we've done is, a, you know, we've changed the way that we spend money over here. Um, so, uh, you know, Colonel George and, uh, and the team here had a pretty uh, neat way of doing the Commander's Emergency Response Programs, which we call CERT. Um, it used to be a, a way that you could kind of go into a community that had just been shaken up by the war and kind of do some quick projects that would um, get development going and, and show some some good faith with the community. But what we found is uh, over time, you know, schools that should be costing twenty or thirty thousand dollars were costing two hundred thousand dollars. And so it's our own, you know, money that's being divvied up in the contracting process. And I think uh, what we've done is we've we've tried to change that by introducing a lot of transparency. And we go to communities and, and, and say, okay, here, you know, you're not going to get indefinite number of projects. We're going to give you a sort of a budget, and, and then you work within that budget. And so what we found is is that the two hundred fifty thousand dollars school, if the budget's only a hundred thousand, maybe the, maybe the school is now thirty thousand, and uh, they do ten other projects because you know there's less room, and they really do want to do different sort of projects. And and again, that helps bring people closer to the government. And that's important because the government will be the ultimate partner that will help protect U.S. interests. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're really here for the president's outlined goals of disrupting, dismantling, and destroying the Al Qaeda network. And uh, and, and so and, and, and you know, and Taliban in, in the in 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 the sense that they they uh, choose to be the insurgents and right. choose to ally with. From reporting from here in Afghanistan, I am Bob Calvert, your host at TalkingWithHeroes.com.